will be protected. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, money is power. Now we've all heard this before, and we really think that this founds the forms the foundation of what side proposition is going to bring to you today. We think that for a country emerging on the global stage, nothing can be more important than money. We think that money is important not only as an end, but also as a means. And it is for this reason that it is inevitable that the next century will be China's century. But before we really get into that, I'd actually like to first define what exactly we're talking about today. So what would China's century look like? Well, essentially we're looking for a country that will dominate the global stage, economically, politically, etc. Something like Britain, the 19th century or America in the 20th century. Now, we think that it is almost inevitable that the next century will in fact be China's century. And there are three reasons as to why this is true. First of all, economic dominance. Second of all, international influence. And third of all, the stagnation of competition. So I'll talk about our first two pillars and my wonderful partner, Gurleen here, will talk about the third. So let's start. Let's talk about exactly why China's economic system is geared towards success. Okay, so it's not a surprise that China's economy is booming right now. We see that last year, their annual growth rate was 10%, the same that it's been for the last 30 years. Furthermore, we think, we see that the IMF has predicted that China's economy will surpass the US's in less than five years. So yeah, we think that China's economy is doing really well. But what side proposition has to say is that we don't think this is a coincidence. We don't think that China just got lucky all of a sudden. We think that China's economic growth is a natural um, result of several factors inherent in China's culture and inherent in China's government system. So let's talk about China's culture first. We see that China's culture is one that encourages hard work. Now, there's a reason for this. China's population is gigantic. If someone isn't working super, super hard, they're not going to have a job. So we see that China's culture is perfectly predisposed to have a very, very strong economy. Second of all, let's look at the importance of education in China. Now, people in China love education. That's why I get things such as the nine hour school day, or things like kids learning calculus in grade 10. So we think that China in the next century won't just have a lot of people, they'll have a lot of really highly trained people. Finally, let's talk about China's government. Now, like it or not, you have to admit that their government is efficient. We see an example of this back in the global recession of um, a while ago. We see that during the global recession, while the rest of the world was trying to survive, China pulled off this really efficient and really effective stimulus package. And as a result, it was one of the countries least hit by the global recession. And we think if China can do it once, then yeah, they can do it again. But that's not really all. What's also important to see is that China's economy right now is following the same path that Britain's economy did in the 19th century and that America's economy did in the 20th century. When we look at these really, really big, really, really powerful economies in the past, we see a very clear pattern start to emerge. We see that each economy goes through this transition, this cycle. We see them go from an agriculture-based economy to one based on manufacturing, to one based on research and technology. For example, let's look at Britain. We saw Britain go from feudalism to the Industrial Revolution, to the Scientific Revolution. We saw the same thing happen in America. And what's interesting is that we're seeing the same thing happen right now to China. Right now, China's economy is based largely on manufacturing. We see workshops, we see things like that. But what's interesting is that we see China starting to move into an economy based on research. For example, let's look at last year. Last year, China surpassed countries like USA, countries like Japan, and they became the world leader in research paid applications. Furthermore, if current trends continue, we'll also see them become the leader in published scientific articles by 2013. So what's important here is that we're, see, we're seeing China follow this historical pattern. We're seeing China follow this historical precedence, this precedence of the scale of manufacturing, the scale of agriculture, the scale of research and technology. We're seeing them go on a path that we've already seen geared towards success. And we think, and we think because history has told us that this is the path to success, we think that because China is following this path, we think that that means that China is also going to follow in the footsteps of Britain and the United States. Furthermore, what's interesting is that we see one of the biggest criticisms of China's economy right now be its lack of um, sustainability. We, we, we see, okay, well, their economy is based on manufacturing, that's not sustainable. But what we have to understand is that once China moves into a research-based economy, their economy is going to be sustainable. Their economy is going to require less people. Don't you agree, sir? Would you agree that uh, the censorship imposed by China's government is actually counterproductive towards research in that country? 
Um, okay, first of all, we don't really think that censorship has much to do with research. We think that research has to do with things like science, things like innovation, and these things are actually supported by China's government. Furthermore, what we have to understand is that China's government isn't going to be static. We don't think that China's government right now is going to be China's government in 50 years. And my partner, Gurlina, is going to talk about this, um, look at the historical precedent of the Industrial Revolution. But let's move on. We don't think that a large economy is really all that we need to become the next world superpower. What we also have to take into account is international influence. So here I move on to my second pillar, this idea of international influence and political power. Now, what we see is that China's economy is going to translate directly into a large amount of political influence. And this is for two really big reasons. First of all, China is the world's banker. We see that right now, China has over $3 trillion in various foreign reserves. So basically, when the world wants to borrow money, they borrow money from China. Second of all, let's look at China's large population. Let's look at their really good recovery to the global recession. What does this mean? It means that China is rapidly emerging as the most dynamic and one of the most attractive markets in the world. For example, let's look at Australia. What we see is that right now, Australia's single largest export market is in fact China. Let's look at the EU. What we see is that if current trends continue, the EU will also export mostly to China. Don't you agree? Well, with a declining population as predicted, don't you think that there's going to be less foreign direct investment into a declining population, a de declining consumer base, a declining working population? Okay, well, first of all, what we have to understand is China's population is gigantic. Even if they shrink a little, they're still going to have billions of people in that population and billions of people to buy the world's goods. Okay, that's basically it. Um, yeah, so basically, what's important to understand is that in the next century, China isn't just going to make all the world's stuff, they're also going to be buying the world's stuff. And we think this makes, means it has a lot of political power. So let's look at what this all really means. Well, first of all, what it means is that China is becoming well known on the global stage. It means that China isn't afraid to make its position heard and make it known throughout the rest of the countries. But what's also important is we're seeing a pattern where countries are becoming economically reliant on China. We're seeing this interesting situation where countries want to be friends with China because China's going to buy their stuff. And we also see a situation where countries now have to become friends with China because China has all their money. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we think that yes, China's economy will translate directly into political influence. So what have we really talked about today? Well, first of all, I talked about how China's economy is not only right now experiencing an economic bloom, but will also continue to do so through the future. We talked about how historical presidents, such as Britain and America, play into this factor as well. And secondly, we talked about international influence. We talked about how China is going to be one of the countries that is most influ influential on the world stage because of the fact that it's invested in so many of the world's other economies. So ladies and gentlemen, for these two reasons, and for the reasons that my partner is going to explain, we really think that this resolution has to stand. Thank you very much.